Okay, so we want to thank everybody for coming. This is the halftime report. How many of you came in were at the beginning of the year? We call it the state of the markets. It's the one we do at the beginning of the year. Okay, great. So at the beginning of the year, remember, we talked about a lot of different possible scenarios that could happen this year. And now we're halfway through the year. We're going to talk about whether or not those scenarios have kind of come true, what's come true, what hasn't come true, what was a surprise, what wasn't a surprise, and then kind of what we think going forward. But before we do that, we have some important disclaimers and disclosures here. I'll just give everybody a moment. Uh, if you have a cell phone, just take the time, if you would, to put that on mute or silent version, if you would, so we don't disturb others next to you who are, are trying to get educated. Give you a second. Last but not least, if you have questions, guess what? If a question pops into your head, chances are somebody else is thinking it too. So I do encourage questions, so please just raise your hand. I'll, I'll try to get to you when I can. But do understand that when we get a little closer to 12, people start getting hungry, <laughs> right? And then, you know, if you're asking questions over after 12 you're, and you're getting, they're getting hungry and hungry, they're going to start looking at you. So just, just know that. I don't have a problem with it. Some more disclaimers, disclosures. You guys know that we're involved with Voya. Voya is our broker dealer. They have our oversight. We like Voya a lot because they're independent and they've been named year after year as one of the world's most eth ethical companies. So you've heard about these other banks out there who have done unethical things to their clients. Well, we're very proud at Voya because we have been named again and again as one of the world's most, most ethical companies and also one of the world's best or the America's best companies to work for. So though we don't work directly for Voya, they oversee our financial stuff and kind of keep us, make sure that we're doing everything correct. But uh, just to make everything clear, we work directly for our clients, which is why there's no conflicts of interest. So just briefly, we're going to talk about what happened the first half of this year so far. It's been pretty volatile, would you agree? Uh, and then we're going to talk about, you know, kind of what drove the good stuff, because we've had a lot of bad stuff. We're going to talk about what kind of drove the good stuff, and then we're going to talk about some forecasts that we think are coming up for the next six months, and then we're going to talk about stuff after that. And everybody in here pretty much knows, if you've been reading my letter, who got my last letter? Good, good. Have you read it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was at a restaurant once, and I asked this guy, well, do you have any uh, ice? Well, I knew he did, and of course he said, well, yeah, I do. And he just walked off. Like, okay, I, can I get some? Oh. So, yes, if you got the letter and you read it, then you know that we're tracking that, those, that monetary contraction, because that's what we're doing now, is we're contracting. So, let's just talk about what happened in the first half this year so far. This is the S&P 500 from basically January through July. And you can see, you can tell there was a lot of volatility there. I mean, it has not been a smooth ride for sure. We hit an all-time high in January 26, and then all of a sudden we had basically a 10% slide right there from January 26 down to February 9th. Uh, we've dropped down into correction territory. A pretty big slide. Anybody know what happened there? What's that? The president? No, you would think so, but no, it wasn't in this case. Any, anybody else? What's that? Pat? I can't remember that far back. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here, Pat. That's why we're here. That's right. History, uh, history is a great guide to the future. It's not, al it's not always, you know, it doesn't always, what do they say? It's not always the same, but it often rhymes, right? Anybody, anybody else want to take a shot at it? Oh, what's that? Wasn't a Fed rate, but it did have something to do with the Fed. Anybody back remember 1987? What happened in 1987? Bad crash, right, back in those days. But what was the instigator for that crash, if you remember? The Fed, as usual, but that's when Alan Greenspan took over. That was Alan Greenspan's inauguration, was the 1987 crash. This was the inauguration for Jerome Powell, our new Fed chairman. That's all it was, guys, a new Fed chairman. That's all it was, nothing else. You see that? And why is that? 
uncertainty. Uncertainty more than anything creates these 10% 10, 10 drops. So here we go again. New Fed chairman, things correct a little bit. We're back up again. Uh, all of a sudden now we start the tariff talk. Tariff talk. Now I'm not going to go into whether that's good or whether that's bad. It just is, right? We just have tariff talk. And tariff talk creates what? Uncertainty. You got it. So it's usually the uncertainty where we hear on, you know, Fox and CNN is just bad news, CNBC and stuff. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But, you know, overall, if you look at the fundamentals, the fundamentals are still very good. There's no reason for it to have all this, but the uncertainty will do it every time. So April, or sorry, March 21st, Fed raises interest rates. Didn't see that coming, right? We've been saying that for years. And this, let me just tell you, they're going to continue to do it. Forget about what Trump says. Forget about what they say. They're just going to continue to do it because that's just what they do. That's their modus operandi. And I'm getting that from history. You go back to history, and I'm going to show you a chart here in a second that when they start that con contraction, they do not stop until what? Market, market crashes. That's how they know. That's how they know they've had enough. The market crashes. But for you and I, we lose 35% of our stock portfolio. So then April 4th, China announces its own tariffs, more uncertainty. Now June 13th, Fed raises rates again. June 15th, more 50, million, 50 billion more in tariffs. So between Fed hikes and new Fed chairman and tariff talk, it's been a very, very volatile year. But we started right here. And we ended up right there. So if you drew a straight line, we did okay, right? But man, it was a volatile in them going on. But I, but that's always the case. That's just how it works. And we kind of do get, we kind of do lose our memory. Or yes, sir. Since the big dip and you know peak, yes, valley, yes. Uh, It, it, what, it, they, it exasperates it. doesn't cause it, but it definitely does exasperate it because what happens is a lot of these computers like Goldman Sachs and a lot of these other large co corporation banks will have computers that are looking at all these different variables. And one of the things that they look at is the VIX. The VIX is the volatility level. VIX spikes when you have bad news and you have a market sort of mini crash, let's say, a mini drop like that. So once that happens... The VIX kicks in, and then these computers start kicking in, and then they start dumping more stuff, and that exacerbates it. That's right. Good question. I would say that it doesn't create it, but it definitely does exacerbate the problem. So what we did was, you know, every year we asked these geniuses from all these different companies who are very well paid about what they think the end year end target's going to be. And there's only one out here that says that they think it's going to be less. Everybody else thinks that we still are going to have good growth for the second half of the season. The average of that would be 7%. So they think altogether, the brain trust here, that altogether over the next six months, we're going to have roughly a 7.1% return as an average. Some are way over that. Only one is in the negative territory. So, you know, take that for what, it, for what it's worth. You know, back in 2007, these guys were all saying that you know, we're going to the moon, and, and we did it. So we, you know, I don't, I don't put a lot of credence in that. So a lot of other people do. But what did drive, you've seen this before, perhaps. These are all the little different dials and indicators that, that go sort of into an economic forecast. So you have Equity market valuation, you know, are prices of stocks high or low relative to their earnings? Monetary policy, is the Fed being easy or are they being tight? Interest rates, fixed income, are interest rates on the rise or are they, on, are they dropping? Inflation, deflation, energy costs, volatility, job creation, disposable personal income, personal consumption, housing, mortgages business sentiment, corporate profit. So you can see that in 2008, 
December 2008, after the market had already crashed, things look pretty sour, do they not? Now, January 2018, the beginning of this year. Everything looks really great, does it not? All of a sudden, everything is green. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think it looked like in 2007? Look just like this. It looked just like this. Now, which one of these is red? You guys up front, which, what, what can you see there? Geopolitical risk. Geopolitical risk. Folks, geopolitical risk is always going to be red. Is that not true? Geopolitical risk is always going to be red. I mean, we went from, you know, we're North Korea, and now we're on to Iran. I don't know who's next, but, you know, there's always that going on. The Syria issue happening. Um, Argentina still wants to attack England over the Falklands. I mean, who knows? I mean, they, they seriously do. They seriously still want to take the Falklands away. And so we'll see what happens there. But here we are now, June 2018, and it looks even rosier. You know, so, but the point I want to stress here is, yes, it looks very, very rosy right now, but it looked the same way in January of 2008, because it wasn't until March of that year that we started having problems. People, you remember that? It's been a while now. It's been 10 years, but, um, but we're kind of right back where we were. So all the signs are showing themselves. To me, it looks a lot like 2007. Cranes everywhere. Construction everywhere, dead trees everywhere. You know, you see what's just happened to our parking lot here, those beautiful trees that we had. They're putting up some sort of condos there or something. So, you know, all this growth, all this expansion becomes because there's so much cash sloshing around and all this cash has been created out of nothing. And that causes inflation. And then once we have inflation, the Fed starts acting on it and they start raising rates and they raise rates and raise rates and they don't stop. And that's where we are today. So we've got to keep a keen eye. Why do trade and tariffs matter? Trade and tariffs matter. Now, you remember that for the United States, our gross domestic product is driven by what? 70% of our GDP is, is driven by what? Consumerism. And folks, we're good at it. We really are. My clients are great at it. My wife is great at it. But, you know, so consumerism is important. As long as we keep spending, everything's good. But the government spending is important, too. The problem with government spending is we don't have the money that we're spending. What are we doing? We're borrowing it more than anything. We're printing it. That's what we call monetizing the debt. And they've done that here recently in another country in the world. You want to guess what country that is? Venezuela. You know, Venezuela's inflation rate this year is scheduled to be a million percent. A, a million percent. Yeah. You guys haven't been following what's going on in Venezuela? It's a bad scene. I saw a picture of a guy who showed me a belt. His belt was about this long. He Obviously, he was a very robust, a rotund person. And then over time, you can see the holes in his belt where he had just shrunk, and now he's like 80 pounds. So he probably went from like 350 down to 80. No. I mean, they're now exhuming bodies illegally just to get the gold out of the teeth or whatever jewelry they may have been buried with. Yeah. So just yesterday, or a couple days ago, Blake sent me an email about how Maduro now is just going to decide to drop off three, three or four zeros off the, off the, off the currency. So we're just going to drop those zeros off. So what was 10,000 now just becomes 10. You think that's going to work? Did anybody remember the Italian lira? All right, everybody, well, we were in Italy when that happened, when the, the, the Italians just decided they're going to slice off three zeros off the lira. How well did that work out? No. I was in Russia in 1993, and they decided that they were going to change the ruble. So all the old rubles, pre-1993 rubles, all of a sudden overnight or over the weekend, really, they're no good. No good. So here I am, an exchange student in Moscow, and I've got all these old rubles, right? They just now have become worthless over the weekend. Currency situations like that can cause a lot of havoc. I don't know how many of you are history students, but if you think back to after World War I in Weimar Republic, Germany, that's what ushered Hitler right in, you know? Because people 
becomes very, and we've never had that in this country, thank God, and I hope we never do, but in other places in the world, it happens again and again, and we definitely have problems here with inflation in this country. A stamp today is how much? 50, 55, I thought. Nobody really knows because, you know, they change it all the time. Nobody knows what a price of a stamp is. What was the price of a stamp in 1965? Five cents. Okay, Riley. Oh, Riley always does airmail. Thanks, Riley. Let's talk about the fundamentals. The fundamentals, believe it or not, happen to do with earnings, corporate earnings. Are corporations being more profitable? Are they being more efficient? Are they being more productive? And yes, they have been. So the bottom line here are the corporate profits. You know, they have good results, and it's been clicking up there. And then the gold line there is the S&P 500. You can see it's been tracking pretty much right along. So that's another thing that we look at. Interest rates are rising. The balance sheet is reducing. Monetary contraction is happening. And then corporate profits at some point will turn sour. And when that happens, that's what we got to watch out for. That could be the signal. So let's look at inflation, because this is something that the Federal Reserve watches very closely. And it's interesting, what does CPI stand for? Very good. Now, what does PCE stand for? Personal consumption expenditure. Personal consumption expenditure. That's how much you consume, how much you spend on personal consumption. So the 50-year average has been about 3.5% on personal consumption. But let's look at the CPI, so that's the core price or the consumer price index, and they, that's one of the things that they look at when they look at inflation. And what they do is they take all these different items and they sort of add them together and see what the price of those items are. But the formula for the CPI has changed over time. Originally, in 1970, it was one thing, and then in 19, 1980, they changed it, and then in 1990, they changed it again. Now, why do you think they changed it? It didn't look good. It was showing too much inflation. That's why they changed it. So they subbed steak for hamburger meat. Okay, yeah, we all went like steak on New York Strip, right? Oh, they don't need New York Strip hamburger meat. Sub that. See how that goes? Little things like that. Instead of fresh orange juice, you know, concentrate. And, and take the energy out. Take the food and the energy out. That's right. So... Little tricks like that, statistics. You know what uh, Mark Twain said about the statistics? There's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Yeah, I thought it was government statistics, but I was recently corrected on that. He didn't say government, but I'm going to insert that for our purposes. So, so now inflation is starting to pick up. The Fed says they want to have inflation at 2%. Um, and, and depending on who you ask, it's probably more than that now. So that's why we're, we're going to start raising rates. Pick up. One thing that we also look at that's very inflationary is unemployment. Now, again, statistics, you know, they can change these things. Uh, for instance, they have these people now that are called the, what they call them, the woefully unemployed. So if they've been unemployed for, no, for over, a long, over a year, they're woefully unemployed, and so they're, we just take them out. Or if they're underemployed, for instance, they don't have a full-time job, they just have a part-time job, we'll take them out. Okay. What was the other caveat, Rick, that they, that they throw in here and they, you know, they take that out? Uh, the underemployed, the woefully employed. What's that? Yeah, no longer seek employment. Exactly. So people who are just no longer, they've given up. I, mean, I guess that's the woefully employed, just given up. They take them out. So it's not exactly, it's not exactly true, but if you can see, we're down to 4% right here. Now, when's the last time that we were that low? Well, right around 2000. What happened then? Dot-com Dot -com bust, right? When was the time before that? 1970. What happened there? Go back to 1973, another crash. What's that? That's right, 1973, another crash. So that's what happens. You can see when there's a spike, another spike, 
Well, that's unemployment. Unemployment happens right after we have a crash. Interest rates rising happen right before. So you have to understand that when you're watching CNN or CNBC or Fox or any of that, of that it's really easy to spin it in any way you want to. For instance, there were some tariffs that occurred right around the Great Depression. And a lot of people will say those tariffs are what caused the Great Depression. But that's not true. Ben Bernanke said they did it. In 2002, Ben Bernanke gave a speech uh, at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party. And in that speech, you can Google it, it's, at the, it's on the Fed website. In that speech, he basically said, yeah, we caused the, we caused the Great Depression, meaning we the Fed. It's right there in his speech. He admitted it. Yeah, but, he said we weren't gonna do it again. but we're not going to do it again. <laughs> Until the next time. Learn from your mistakes. We're not going to do it again. Thanks to you, Milton Friedman, we're never going to do it again. Well, take that for what it's worth. You can believe that if you want to. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to say, yes, you are going to do it again because it's happened again and again. That's what happened in 2008. Consumer sentiment, where is consumer sentiment today? Well, you know, it dropped off significantly after 2008, but now we're kind of back up there again. We're almost back up to where we were in 1990, 1966. Really feeling really good. So, you know, you've heard that phrase, a hearty pride comes before the fall. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anybody here, but I'm trying to show you that we are kind of back in 2006, 2007. I mean, we can see how things look the same. Does anybody disagree? I mean, feel free if you do, because I'm always open to new ideas. But you can see that the, all the data, all the charts, all the information, one. I'm going to show you that in a second. If you look at home sales, remember these home sales back in those days were huge, right? But, but remember what was going on back then. You could walk in, anybody could just walk in, no dock loans. Remember those? Right. What's that? The breath test. Yeah, can you, I mean, are you alive? Hello? Okay, sign here. We'll give you a loan. That's exactly what was going on. And then what happened? We had those adjustable rate mortgages, right? Interest rates started going up. The rates started adjusting. People's mortgages doubled and tripled in some case. My uncle, his, my own uncle got caught up in that. He didn't talk to me before he did it. You know, why would you go in at a time when your rates are at an all-time low and buy an adjustable loan? That's the time to buy a fixed loan. Right? But no, that's not what they were pushing because you could get, remember LIBOR, 1% LIBOR, three arm, three one arm or whatever, and then, and then they start adjusting up. And then everybody got, basically a lot of people had to file bankruptcy or walked away. So that's one of the reasons I believe that the housing market is not back up to where it was because a lot of these people who owned homes then can't get a loan now because their credit was so bad. Now, it is easier today than it was, say, five years ago to get a loan, but they still, I think these days are checking, aren't they? They're checking these days, right? So I think that's one of the reasons. But guess what? With, when it comes to rentals and apartments, all-time high. Because people can't buy a home, so they have to rent. And you just drive around where we are and look at all of the new apartment construction. We don't have the roads for it. I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be gridlock all the time. But all these apartments that are going up, these are going to be rentals right here. You know, so that's, that's the dynamics. The mortgage rate. Mortgage rate's pretty much lower than it's ever been except a couple years ago. So you would think, okay, with these low-interest mortgages, on a fixed rate, people would be buying more homes. But I think most of them have ruined their credit. Because if you think about it, the people who had those homes back in 2008 held on, the ones that could, right? And the ones who got evicted or lost their home, you know, they, they ruined their credit too, and it's, it's real hard for them to get back in. Yes, ma'am. Is it, is it longer than seven years that the credit is affected, or is it longer than It's longer than The seven-year thing is the bankruptcy rule. And, you know, you can file bankruptcy, then supposedly seven years later you can start getting credit. I knew this couple once. And she would file bankruptcy, and then three and a half years later, he would file bankruptcy, and three and a half later, she would file bankruptcy. So they had this thing going where they would rack up the, the, the credit on one person and file bankruptcy, and then by that time, 
the other person's credit was now starting to roll. So it actually isn't in seven years. It's, it's less than that. Did you have something, Lynn? Okay. You were saying that's a good plan. You've tried it? <laughs> the things in this world, right? It's just crazy. So let's revisit some forecasts. Remember I said at the beginning of the year we had some forecasts, and we had two themes, the good theme and the bad theme. So let's look at the bad theme. Trump indicted for obstruction of justice. That was one possibility that we started out in January. Well, I guess they're still working on it, right? Hadn't happened yet, but they're still working on it, so we'll see how that goes. America goes to war with North Korea. That was a real possibility, wasn't it? Remember that? We were thinking about something. Things were getting hot. It ain't over yet. We, there's always hope, right? <laughs> the European Union. European Union collapse. You'd like that, Riley, right? <laughs> European Union collapses. European Union, well, hasn't happened yet. I guess they're still working on that one, too. And then, you know, what's some oh, new, new tax bill spurs economic growth. I think that there's some truth there. Would you agree? I think there is. Uh, tension with North Korea eases. I think that's true, right? Um, Europe continues to strengthen despite Brexit. Well, I think Brexit, I, you know, I don't know really exactly what, what, what the changes were with Theresa May and why everybody was so upset with her, but I got the impression that it wasn't the autonomy that they wanted, that they were still sort of under the control of maybe the European Union. But we'll see how that works out. So I don't know if anybody, anybody followed that. Who was the guy who retired, the blonde-haired guy? What's that guy's name? Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, yeah. So he retired very angry because Theresa May had changed the deal on the Brexit deal. You know, but they've tried everything they can to keep Brexit from happening, and it seems still to be going forward. But will that collapse the European Union? I, doubt, I don't think so. I don't think so. For the most part, they've turned out to be better than they could have. Don't you agree? Okay, so let's look about going forward. Some forecasts make you know, make all the difference, really, behind the scenes. You know, the noise and the uncertainty caused that volatility, but behind the scenes, when people are buying stock for the longer time, they do look for the fundamentals. So these are projections. These are the projections going forward that, you know, we're going to have a 2.8% growth this year in GDP and then 2.4%, you know. And so if you look at these projections in history, no one ever projects a, a correction. Have you ever noticed that? They never project bad times. It's like a friend of mine who goes to, a client of mine, he goes to Las Vegas a lot. And I always hear about the times he wins. But I have to ask myself, every time I talk to you, you're, you've won. How does that happen? And his wife speaks up I'm like, well, he never tells you about the times he loses. You know? And isn't that true about most things? You know, so yes, I never hear about the times he loses, and I, I got a feeling from her that it's it happens a lot more than the times he wins. Build those casinos on losses, right? The earnings per share, oh, I guess I can't go back, but earnings per share through the roof, higher than ever for stocks, and that's a very fundamental thing that people look forward to. Um, so let's we were talked about raising interest rates, that's happening, and we're going to talk about quantitative tightening. Now, what is quantitative tightening? It's the opposite of quantitative easing, right? And what is quantitative easing? Buying bonds. And what does that do, really? Increases the money supply. That's right. Crowd. Now, I've shown you this before many times. Everybody should have seen this before. And these are the. This is the Fed funds rate. This is you know before it was Ben Bernanke, and then it was Janet Yellen, and now it's Jerome Powell. But you can see that, and it's hard to see these gray lines, but the gray lines running vertically are essentially recessions. And a recession occurs right after a stock market crash. There's crashes, and sometimes there aren't recessions, because a recession technically has to last 20 months. So there's sometimes you have a crash on here, but you don't have a gray line because, well, the recession didn't last for the prescribed period. But right before a recession, and particularly, right before a crash, what, do, what happens? What do we see? We see a rise in interest rates. This is a man-made thing. This is not a market-driven thing. So we can tell that we're on the tail end there. You see we're moving up again. So you see we, 
We move up, we crash, we have to reverse. Move up, crash, reverse. Move up, crash, reverse. Move up, crash, reverse. And you can see that each time we've had to reverse, the rate has been lower and lower. You see that? The way I look at these numbers, that's the number that was needed to crash the market. So we came off the gold standard in 1971. Vietnam's happening right through here. You know, so we had some major inflationary areas here. We had interest rates at 12.5%. Then Volkner came in after Reagan was elected and jacked us all the way up to almost 18%. Anybody remember Paul Volkner? Remember Ronald Reagan? Remember Jimmy Carter? Remember Jimmy coming off the plane, got his own bag? He's going to do it all himself, you know? And then he puts the solar panels on the White House. So we get them all up there. Then Reagan gets elected. And what does he do? Pulls them off. I mean, we, got, we, got, we already spent the money to put them up there. But no, they pull them off. So that's just the way it works. So here we are now. It's like we're going to build this wall, and then the next person gets in. They're going to tear it down. And we've just spent all that money. So here we are. We, we think, and I have, to, you know, I have to qualify that, nobody knows for sure. But if the last rate that was needed to crash the market was five and a quarter, and the rate before that was like six and a half, Logic holds, does it not, that the next one would be lower? Does anyone disagree? See something I don't see? Mr. Math Genius? No? Okay. So we think the warning track is right around there. Now, all things being equal, I feel very, very confident about that. But I want to show you one thing that concerns me. So here we are. This is, a, this is the one year... Um, zoom in, or excuse me, the five-year zoom in of the Fed funds rate. So you can see we were tracking along here very close to zero. And then Janet Yellen brought us in for a little smooth ride, and then it's just going to be, I think it's just going to be every time we have a, a meeting, we're going to have a rate hike. So we have two more rate hikes this year, most likely, and then at least three more next year. Each one of those is most likely going to be a quarter of a point. So that's 1.25. That's 125 basis points increase from where we are today. And where we are today is about 1.8. So 1.7 plus 1.8, you know, puts us at about 3.5. 3.5. That's going to be a danger zone. That's, our, that's in our warning track. So... We believe the beginning of the warning track is right about 2.75. I'll show you another chart here in a second that may help a little bit. This one, and this is a scatter graph, and I apologize because I know it's a little fuzzy in the back there, but essentially this rate right here, if we look at 5% on the 10-year treasury, this stuff is all stocks that perform negatively. These are the market perform positively, more positive up here, negative here. But the threshold seems to be 5%. Do you see that? So when the rate's uh, on the other side of 5%, everything does negatively. When it's below 5%, everything seems to do positively. Does everyone see that? Now, this is, again, is, these are all averages. And remember, sometimes the interest rates were around 8%. Sometimes they were, like now, around 25 3% on the Treasury. Okay, so because we've had historically low interest rates, I don't, want, I don't want you to say, oh, well, we're completely safe because the yield is under five, right? <laughs> because what, where we are right now, where we have been, is an extremely low rate environment. So this is history, and history is showing us something that, yes, for the most part, rates had to be above 5% for a market crash to occur. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's true this time. Does everyone follow me? Because rates have been uncommonly low. Did that just blow your mind? Everybody okay with that? Do you just want me to move on? Okay. There's one little thing that, that, that I, I often sort of joke about, because when, when you watch CNN or Fox or CNBC or any of those, and a lot of times if something negative in the world happens, scary event, Syria, scary event, Iran, Afghanistan, North Korea, whatever it may be, a world scare. Money, institutional money, runs into treasuries. When it runs into treasuries, you can't buy treasuries with anything but what? 
dollars. Okay, so you've got all this money coming out of euros and out of yen and out of whatever else, and it's moving into dollars. What does that do to the price of the dollar? Drives it up. Supply and demand, right? The more demand you have for something, the price goes up. So when we have a scary event in the world, people, institutions mainly, run into treasuries. To do that, they got to buy dollars. When they buy dollars, it drives up the price of the dollar. Everybody, the value of everybody else's currency drives down a little bit. What that does to treasuries is it drives up the price of treasuries. When you drive up the price, you drive down the yield. Okay? Now think of it this way. If I know that a CD today is paying 2%, and I, I feel really, really confident that next year that CD will pay 3%. How far out am I going to go on that CD? Am I going to buy a five-year CD? One year or maybe even less, right? Because that CD is going to lose value if I try to sell it out there in the market. Now, people don't sell their CDs. They hold them. But with bonds, bonds are priced to buy and sell. So if you buy a bond today at 3%, and the next year that very same bond comes out at 4%, the price of your bond dropped by how much? 25%, right? Because you've got to discount your bond to make, the to make the yield the same on the new bond. So when the price of the bonds go up, the yield goes down. When the price of the bonds go down, the yields go up. Right now, interest rates are going up, so those old bonds that were yielding less are also worth less. Does that make sense? So that's why you don't want to hold a bond that's a 10-year bond, just like you wouldn't want to buy a CD that's a 10-year CD at those low rates. You want, to hide, you want to hold bonds that are short-term bonds. So go home and look in your accounts. That's what you're going to find. You're going to find short-term bonds. Now, when interest rates go up, we reverse that situation because as interest rates get higher and higher, we want to go out further and further because the opposite is also true. When interest rates are driving down, which they will after the next crash, I guarantee you, <laughs> it happens every time, the question is, are we going to go negative? Are we going to go negative? Did you know that for the better part of this last decade, that several banks, central banks in Europe have been negative? Who knew that? If you've been reading my letters, you probably did. All right? The Bank of Japan has been negative. They just have just now decided maybe not go negative. But Switzerland started it. Germany was doing it for a while. In Switzerland, they passed a law that said you could not withdraw your cash more than $10,000. They started passing laws that said that you couldn't do cash transactions in excess of $2,000. Because what were people doing? Why would, you, why would you leave money in a bank and pay the bank interest? You take your money out, right? So they started passing laws that say you couldn't do that. So the next time that we have a big crash here, it's possible, because I guarantee the Fed was looking at they wrote some they wrote some theory papers on it, that I read that says, you know, hey, this kind of worked out okay. This gives us a little more leverage because we were almost to zero last time. And you see the chart. You see how it's lower and lower each time, right? I'm just throwing that out there as a possibility because Europe has tried it, Japan has tried it, and our Fed or Reserve Bank thinks, you know, well, maybe that's a possibility. Easing and quantitative tightening. This is... The um, assets of the Federal Reserve, all Federal Reserve banks, total assets. Now, it gets a little confusing here, but here's how our system works. You have Congress. I don't care what you think about them. We still have them. And you have the Treasury, and then you have the Federal Reserve. And Congress spends too much money, surprise, and they say, hey, we have a shortfall of a trillion dollars, trillion dollar shortfall. So they go to the treasury and say, hey, treasury, we need a trillion dollars. Issue some treasuries. Anybody in here have treasuries? Yeah. My grandpa used to have lots of treasuries, and you know he worked, and he had money, and he bought treasuries. Okay. 
But in the big world, in the big numbers, the Treasury turns to the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, I need a trillion dollars. I'm going to sell you a trillion dollars worth of treasuries that are just really pieces of paper, right? Then the Treasury says, okay, I'm going to give you a trillion dollars in dollars. And how do they do that? Do -do 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 -do. They don't even print it anymore. They don't even bother the precious electronic. Do -do -do -do. We, and in fact, you can see, on, there was a CNN, there was a, a 60 Minutes episode where Ben Bernanke is talking about that. He's like, well, we don't even print it anymore. We just mark up the computer. We mark up their account in the computer. And so now a trillion dollars has just been created out of nothing, and now the Treasury has it, and that's how you get your Social Security checks. That's how you get your Social Security checks, folks. I'm not lying to you. That's how Medicare is paid for. That's how Medicaid is paid for. That's how most of our cruise missiles and military industrial complex is paid. And the problem now is as interest rates rise, the, the interest that we have to pay on our debt is going to get higher and higher, and it's going to become a bigger chunk of the money that we owe, and we're going to have to print more money to pay the interest. And this is the cycle that Venezuela got caught in. Now, the difference between the United States and Venezuela is you can go to almost any country in Africa and almost any country in Asia and almost any country in Europe, and they are going to take your dollars. But I guarantee you, you go to Uzbekistan and try to give them some Venezuelan boulevard, they're not going to even know what this is, right? So the problem with a lot of these countries is they print their money, but the money doesn't get past their borders. We've been very lucky since World War II because everybody wants U.S. dollars because that was the world U.S. reserve currency. That was the world reserve currency. Everybody traded in dollars behind the scenes, especially if they wanted to buy oil. Well, those things are changing. The dollar is no longer the sole reserve currency. Now it's the SDR the special drawing right created by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which is not part of the United States government. It's out, outside of that. It's not part of anybody's government, as a matter of fact. Nobody has control over it. They're their own sovereign world. So the IMF now has this thing called the SDR, the special drawing right, which is comprised of the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yuan, or sorry, the yen, and now the Chinese yuan. Those five currencies. And that's the world reserve currency, and that's what everybody's trading in behind the scenes, no longer the dollar. So when we talk about how much money the Fed has printed out of nothing and handed over to the Treasury, or at least kept on balance, you can see here we're cruising right along at about $800 billion. Then TARP hits. Remember TARP? Okay, so we went from $800 billion to $2.2 trillion. Just like that. How long would it make? How long would it take all of us to earn that much money? A thousand years? I don't know. But just like that, a two trillion dollars created. And then we had TARP, and then we had QE, and then we had Operation Twist, and then we had just QE Infinity. So we went from 800 billion to over 4.4 trillion. Does everyone see that? This is the chart. When I said I, this time, it's a little different. Remember, I said before all things being equal, I feel very, very confident about that warning track. This is the unknown, folks. That's never happened before. That's, that's the new kid on the block. How do we handle this, this behemoth here? But you can see that we're starting to taper off right there. You see that? If you look, it looks bigger. <laughs> you zoom in, you can see, okay, well, four, four and a half trillion down to 4.2 trillion. Those are big, big numbers. But this is the unwinding. This is the contraction effect. So that's the unknown. How far do we need to contract in order to crash this thing? Is it possible that interest rates could get up to 5%? Is it possible interest rates could get to 6 because of this? Possible. I think it's possible. I think you'd be a fool to say never. But I don't want, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to sit around and wait to see what happens. You know, we're going to follow our plan, and that is that when we get to up to where we think 3.5%, 4%, we're batting down. We are, we are waiting for it to happen. And so we might miss out on some growth. 
but I've talked to almost every one of my clients and they will always tell me, I'd rather you be early than late. Am I right or am I right? I'm right. That means we gotta stay focused. Stay focused on the fundamentals. We look at earnings per share. We look at the profitability of the companies. We look at interest rates as they continue to rise. So that's what we're watching very closely. As interest rates continue to rise and they continue to take money out of the economy, just a matter of time. So that's what we're watching. And then when we get to that point where we start 2.5%, 2.75, for every quarter point that they raise from there, we're gonna take 10% and move it out of the more risky things. What are those riskier things? Well, the things that have done the best. Merging markets, small cap stocks, mid-sized stocks, uh, and some, and then you know you just kind of go up the uh, up the ladder. So we want to stay focused on the. This is interesting too, and kind of gives you an idea of how volatile things are. And just because you have a a really bad year, in the middle of that year, it actually can end up. To be pretty well, to do pretty well. So I want to focus in like this year right here in 2009. 2009 ended up being 23% positive, but at one point in the year it was down 28%. So 2009, at one point it was down 28%, but by the end of the year it had finished up 23%. That's a 50%. It's huge, that's a huge move, right? So a lot of people got scared. A lot of people got scared, they jumped out. But if they had stayed in, they'd have had a double digit year, you see? So that's what we really get paid to do, is keep you in in times like that and get you out when it looks rosy as it can be. And so right now this year, it's been a lot of volatility, interest rates, new Fed chairman, t trade tariffs. You know, we don't know when the next shoe is going to fall, but there have been these incredible tax breaks that have come down from corporations and are just now starting to hit the bottom line. In the fourth quarter, we're really going to start hearing these results, and I think we're going to see an all-new high before the end of the year. I really do. So that's always the trick when, you, when, we, when, we, have, when we have these interest rate hikes. Market's doing really, really well. 2007 was a great year, you know, so you don't want to miss it. But as we get higher and higher and closer and closer to that warning track, then we're going to take some of our profits. And just, and just as sort of a side note, I say this all the time, but, you know, I used to be a disc jockey. I don't know if you guys knew this. And so... <laughs> Uh, I, I know how it works. I know kind of how it works. You know, we sell advertising at this radio station, and we get more for our advertising when we have more listeners, and we have more listeners when we have bad news. It's just the way it is, folks. I'm just, it's just human nature. I mean, I, I stop. I'm like, why are we having all this traffic? I mean, where's this terrible traffic? And I look, oh, there's an accident on the other side. There's no reason why my lane should be slowing down, except everybody wants to look, <laughs> right? That's just human nature. So the tendency to focus on the negative, this is CNBC viewership versus the S&P 500 from 2004 through 2014. And look at this. As the S&P index goes down, their viewership goes way up. If the market's doing well, nobody wants to watch. And it's the same way in my office. Nobody's been, I don't hear from anybody. I'm like, my client's alive? I mean, I don't hear from anybody, you know? Because the market's doing well. No problems. We're out spending our money. That's right. We're out getting new kitchens and new driveways and new RVs and taking 30-day cruises and new train sets. and it just goes on and on. But I'm happy for everybody. I really am. And you guys are a great big family to us, and we really do appreciate it. But we are, you know, you see, I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be stressed. Because stress is a killer. Stress is a killer. I want you to be not stressed because you'll live a lot longer and you'll live a lot happier that way. Questions about anything I've talked about? Yes, Earl, I knew you'd be the first one. The yield curve? Um, the yield curve is probably inverted. If it's not inverted, it should be. I mean, because interest rates are going up, the same thing with the CDs. Why would you want to buy a 10-year bond 
when your one-year bond next year is going to be worth less, you know, because the interest rates are going up. So the inverted yield curve makes perfect sense. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, that's really uh, that's you know if if you wait till maturity you haven't lost anything. So I would I would have a ten, what I would do is take a look and see well how much have a loss have you already incurred? Are you flat or have you actually incurred a significant loss? And if you if you incurred a significant loss and you sold those bonds, what are you going to do to recover that loss? What are you going to invest them in? Well, you can invest them in stocks for a little while. You don't want to go back into bonds, that's for sure. Stocks are probably going to do good for the next couple of maybe 18 months, you know. After that, I don't know. So it's hard to say absolutely. But the first thing I would do is look and see where you are today. If you have had no losses so far, I would go. I would go ahead and sell them. If you had, you know, hopefully you had a little bit of profit. But if you have it, then you're maybe you're down only a little bit. I'd go ahead and get out because they're going to drop more. But if you hold them to maturity and they're good quality, then you will. Have at least gotten your, your, you know, your principal back plus the interest, coupon interest. So, the, I, hate, I hated this about law school because every every question you asked the professor, the answer was always, well, it depends. <laughs> but you know, after four years of law school, I understand why it depends. Because it depends on what district you're in, it depends on the facts of the case, it depends on the mood of the judge. A lot of unknowns. You no. Know? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, I, you know, usually the longer the term of the boom market, the longer and the greater depth of the bear market. That's right. That's right. The depth that's out there is a lot bigger than it was in 2008. He's right. Yes, Riley. Yes. Yes. And that's usually precursor to a major move one direction or the other. Yes. Uh, I, that's technical analysis, and I'm, I'm not a big proponent of technical analysis. I like fundamental analysis myself, but there's a place for it. So I think that, you know, the anomaly this year so far has been the new Fed chairman. There's always a, a hiccup there when there's a new Fed chairman in place. And then the other sort of anomaly have been the trade, the trade wars going on. So, but you know, if you go back to the trade situation, mainly against China, China has pegged their currency against ours for since 1984, I believe it was. So, you know, that's that's not fair. It's not fair. It's an artificial peg. Artificial pegs are never fair in a free trade market environment. So, I think this is working that out because you know, the last 20 years it just hasn't worked. And China has gotten very wealthy off of stealing all of our ideas and replicating them there. I was, I've been in China, and when there was this one bridge, I'm looking at this bridge over Savannah, and I see like 10 of these in China. It's exactly the same bridge. You know, well, the engineers from China came over and helped build the bridge in Savannah and then took that knowledge back over there, and they're just, there's like four of them in Wuhan. So, you know, there is, there is, some, there is something to that, you know, that, that, that technology and that, and because if you want to go to China and build a plant, it's required that you give them all of your technical knowledge. And what do they do? They set up shop next door and become your number one competitor and drive you out of business. Yeah, well, they're you know it's it's having a ripple effect for sure. That's right. I know people are starting to get hungry. 
are looking at me with a little bit of an evil eye. So I'm going to go ahead and stop. Yes, sir. One more. I try not to. Uh, I try not to. Um, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm so sick of it, I can't stand it. I had to get my phone cut off. I literally had to get my phone cut off because I was getting so many. Because I was in uh, Tom Price's district. I'm in Tom Price's district, and when he became that one. Yeah, exactly. Homeland Security or whatever. Health and Home and Human Security. So we were having that huge. They were just. It was the most expensive election campaign in the history of the United States. And it was happening right on my phone. And so, I mean, <laughs> so I'll be honest with you. I, I, I have no comment about, I'm, I'm, I, I don't even want to talk about politics anymore. I'm so sick of it. Uh, yes, I do. But, but what's great, here's what I'd like to talk about, lunch. There's cookies. We have, everybody gets a cookie, and we have extra cookies. Okay. So listen, I want to thank you so much. If you're not a client yet, Come on in. Let's just talk about it. We'll kick the tires and see if it works. Otherwise, have a fantastic summer. Stay cool. Stay safe. And we love all of you.